the spreadsheet that she's on the county board, and she was going around and getting all the elected officials. Anybody in our district, she's up for election, so remember her name, Gretchen Fritz. Go 
Gloria Golder is not running yet, but she doesn't have a socialist either running against her. <laughs> Debbie Militello as a socialist. There's Debbie. You gotta remember that. <laughs> and Margo McDermott. Everybody knows Margo. Did you know she hates women? According to her social social opponent, she hates women. Her, her opponent is not only a socialist, but he's a liar. <laughs> then we got Raquel Mitchell. She's a Wheatland Township trustee, and she's a great singer. Now we got Nick Stella. Nick just took on Foster in an argument about what? He made Foster look like an animal. Thank you, Nick. Jim Bajal Lee, and oh yeah, he's right there. He's running for treasure, and he's a socialist. He is a socialist, though. And Foster goes around saying he's a socialist. He's a progressive, low blood socialist, and he's not at all. Lori McPhillips, right there, she's running for clerk. She's honest. She has integrity. She can be bonded. She can take on the blockers. There are things I can't say about her socialist opponent. And I would, believe me, you know what, I'm just appalled. But anyway, we all got to remember to vote for Lori because if the other side, the socialists, can control that clerk's office, just think of the corruption that can go down when they run elections. So you got to make sure we get all of our friends out to vote. If we get our friends out, we win. Now you got Annette Parker. Oh my gosh, you got two socialists. <laughs> then we got uh, Rick Leia. I can't say that word right, my tongue won't work. But now you have, you have the guy that has not proclaimed himself as a socialist, but I think he is. Am I right? Am I right? <laughs> well, there's progressives and then there's progressive socialists. And you know, then there's just my socialists. They all stay. <laughs> And then we have Alicia Bedford. Alicia, God bless you. You're one that is a progressive. I don't think she's a socialist. Or am I wrong? Tell me I'm wrong. She's both, right? Oh my God. You know what? Folks, we got to get out and get rid of the socialists. America is a capitalist society. And if we don't get out and vote, get our friends to vote. People in this room should get at least 10 people to the polls and vote Republican. Because there are no socialist Republicans. <laughs> Democrats want to raise your taxes and Republicans don't. And if there were socialists in the room, they say, oh, that's wonderful, because they want to raise your taxes. And Republicans believe in new process, and Democrats don't. So just remember that when you go to the polls. Now I'm going to introduce uh, Doug Mayhall. He's the new president of the uh, Illinois State Rifle Association. He's part of the community too. And I was also a I want to thank everybody coming here and uh, supporting the ISRA. And what I'm going to talk about a minute is the ISRA. It was formed in 1903. It was started as uh, to help the military learn how to shoot, and it has been a training, educational, and Second Amendment right for the last 115 years. And for the last 11 years of that, Don Moran has been the president until I became president a few months ago. And through Don's leadership, we have uh, filed many lawsuits and won many lawsuits. Probably the two most historic ones were Otis and McDonald versus Chicago, and that went all the way to the Supreme Court, and we won that, I think, June 29th of 2010. <laughs> what that case was about was basically saying that a person has the right to carry a gun for personal protection. And Chicago had different views, but we went on that and we prevailed. And ultimately, that led...
led us to getting our concealed carry. We were the last state in the union that did not have concealed carry. When we got this, it allowed to. So the next step was going after concealed carry. It took us another three years, but we got that on July 9th, I believe, of 2013. So finally, we have concealed carry. And Don's leadership and foresight has been a huge factor in getting us there. And thank you, Don. Uh, 
it's a bad with uh, Dan Proft. I, um, you know, the, we, we talked about getting Ollie North, but Ollie North wanted, uh, what, 60,000 bucks at the time, and that didn't work. And then we had somebody who uh, would do it for 25,000. It was getting close to it. So I, I told Doug I'd do it for a thousand. I thought that was fair. Yeah. And, and here I am. I did. And uh, he gave me a coupon book. I paid that 100 bucks a month. And so, that's that checks in the mail. Yeah. And I, and, yeah, you know, a couple of months ago at the cigar thing, I said if Amy ever can't make it, I'd fill in. And you've got John Cass. John Cass is a contributor in the Chicago Tribune. He's got a voice for silent movies. I, I actually had blonde wig I was going to wear to show you how dedicated I am. And then I found out Rich Vaughn is in the audience and he runs, you know, he's the publisher for the Illinois Shooter. And I can just picture me on the cover of the Illinois shoe wearing a blonde wig. So that was a chilling effect for sure. Yeah. I want to uh, I want to thank Steve uh, for that interesting introduction. Uh, when I was at Bowling Green State University, they used to introduce me as a Buckeye, which I offended me because I'm a wine eye. And it also offended me because I had no idea what the hell a Buckeye was. And I went and looked it up finally, and a Buckeye is a small, brown, fatty, hairless nut of no commercial value. So it probably does. Speaking of Jamie Pritzker, <laughs> is that a segue or two? That's a segue. Um, look, he's out spending one or two to one hundred million dollars of his own money. And I've got to tell you something. How many people in here have an AR or a modern sporting rifle? How many people in here have a magazine that's over ten rounds? He has gone on record saying that we in Illinois should not own military-type weaponry like that. And let's put that aside. That's him to on the wealthy. Sitting in this room, I think we're going to be the wealthy. And he's also told us that Oregon is the ideal example for mileage. Getting a GPS put in your car. And, and Gretchen and I talk about it all the time on the show. The last thing that is happening to John Q. Public that we want is the eroding of their civil rights. I don't want them to know where we're going. So here's what I'm telling you. Um, critics say that Rauner can't win. I've heard this over and over again. Rauner can't win. And I'm just going to tell you, I've heard two kinds of people. There are people who say, well, critics are telling me I can't win. I'm going to sit this one out. Really? I'm going to sit this one out? And then the other group is people who are saying, vote your conscience. I'm going to vote my conscience. I'm going to vote for McCann. He's the only real conservative, which may be true. Or I'm going to vote for uh, Jackson because he's a libertarian. I say to hell with your conscience, vote with common sense. You know, this is a two-candidate race. It's Pritzker and it's Rauner. And if you vote for anyone else, it's going to be a vote for Pritzker. If you don't vote, it's going to be a vote for Pritzker. So... He's been, Rauner's been our backstop. Don't let the critics dictate whether or not you go and vote or how you vote. And I just want to stress this. Theodore Roosevelt hated critics. Just hated them. And he stressed exactly what we stress, and that is John Q. Public together is what runs this company. That's who makes this country great. And it's the power of collected officials. And so I just want to read something that he gave in a speech back at the turn of the 20th century. It's not the critic who counts. It's not the man who points out where the strong man stumbled. It's not the man who points out where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by the dust and the sweat and the blood, who strives valiantly errors and comes up short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who actually strives to do the deeds. He knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, and he spends himself of a worthy cause. And who at best, in the end, knows the triumph of high achievement. And at worst, if he should fail, at least he fails while daring greatly, for his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who have known neither victory nor defeat. I say critics be damned. John Q. Public has the power. Go out and vote and bring someone with you. Thank you. Before I bring the next speaker up, I wanted to thank my committee. It's uh, Doug 
Mayhall, Legal Harry, Russian Prince, and Dave Lombardo. We've been meeting since last uh, February to put this together. So thank you very much, guys. And lady, I look not a girl. <laughs> I'm, I don't know how I talk now because, you know, this political correct stuff. you got to say the right stuff. Uh, <laughs> no, it's true. Come on, I, I say stuff. I'm 68. I say stuff like I can walk with. You know, I use slangs and verbiage that nobody should use. All right, you know what? We got Mike Weissman. He's our, our sound guy. Thank you very much. He was here last year. Thank you walk up with my brain when he's going up. Not me, my brain. But now I want to uh, thank Richard Pearson for all the stuff he does. He's our executive director of the ISRA. He's going to come up and say a few words. I'm not a socialist. Okay. Let's get that clear right now. Uh, I'm very proud to be the executive director of the ISRA, and I'm very proud to serve all of you people out there. The ISRA has won, uh, we're counting up the awards, we're the Negro Herring yet. I forgot how many we had, but we won 16 or so awards uh, over the years for uh, being an excellent state association, affiliates of the year, and that sort of thing. But the reason we win those awards is because we don't try to work for them, we try to work for the gun owners of this state. And that's why I'm here, that's why you're here, and that's why these fundraisers are very, very important. I told uh, Pete Delaney earlier today that politics is like a steam local mud, except you feel it with money, not coal. And that's really true. You have to fight all kinds of battles, and you have to fight the battles you not expecting. So we have a great organization. It's made up of our members, our staff. I'll give you an example. I talked to Margo earlier, and she said she needed a letter out to her district. We have the date filled, the date is filled tomorrow. I said, we got to get a letter out from Margo. They said they'd be in early. Great staff, great staff. So anyway, thank you very much for coming tonight. Uh, and just make your credit card to your wallets at the door. We'll return whatever you want. Thank you. matter 
as long as you have Chicago Democrats in control of the General Assembly with a supermajority in the Senate. And effectively, it's been a supermajority in the House, thanks to on again, off again, surrender Republicans. So let me just state this unequivocally, because sometimes this gets lost in the high profile races where all the money is spent. Although we're spending quite a bit of money, I am through my pack and other people are on legislative races. This will never be a conservative reform state like Indiana or Wisconsin have been over the last decade. And the Republican Party will never be a majority party in this state unless we are the party of the suburbs. We have got to win in suburban Cook County and the Collars. We have got to play in the city of Chicago, particularly when our issue agenda is ascendant, particularly as Chicago Democrats have driven the state and the city into the ground. The worst governed city in the country and the worst governed state in American history. And that's not hyperbole. That's a description that fits the data. We have got to be a party in, in the suburbs. And the only way we get there, the only way, is to do the one thing we haven't tried. We've tried everything else. We've tried socialism. We've tried corporatism. We've tried being the Republican Party at the leadership level, being junior partners to the Democrats, and protecting people's little fiefdoms at the expense of the greater good and the greater potential for the party. The one thing we haven't tried is the thing that works everywhere it is tried, conservative reform across the board, economic issues as well as moral issues. And if we're not going to be that party, then Godspeed, because you will continue to see people flee this state like it's on fire. You will continue to have the irony of the worse they make it, the smaller our margin of error, the better it gets for them because people who are productive, people who believe in our constitutional rights, people who believe in the proportion of authority between the government and the citizen will continue to find a better quality of life at a lower cost elsewhere. Fact. Fact. It's remarkable to me that we even have trouble generating this consensus in the Republican Party, but that's a fact too. And as we've seen the last three weeks, it turns out leadership really matters, doesn't it? If not for President Trump, and if not for uh, all the fair criticisms of him notwithstanding for Mitch McConnell, Brett Kavanaugh's not on the Supreme Court. That's a fact too. So we can have all the Margot McDermott's, and it's great that Margot's there. We can have all the Margot McDermott's as backpatchers in the General Assembly. Until we get people like Margot McDermott in leadership as leaders of the House Republican Caucus and leaders of the Senate Republican Caucus and statewide candidates and statewide office holders, we're not going to be a majority party. And we're not going to be a party that, frankly, is particularly distinguishable from the Democrats and thus the deficits we face in places we shouldn't face them. Thus losing races in suburban communities that we shouldn't be losing. Thank goodness, I will tell you, thank goodness, and I say this not being cavalier about what Brett Kavanaugh and his family went through, but thank goodness that that happened for our very narrow parochial political interests. Because I can tell you without the Kavanaugh bump, that's occurred over the last few weeks, we would be looking at Republican incumbents in suburban Cook and particularly the Collar counties who've been, who hold seats in districts that have been Republican since I was alive, frankly, districts that have been Republican since America was a forest in deep, deep trouble with respect to their reelections. Deep trouble. And obviously, we still have fights in this state that are important at the federal level for maintaining control of the House. Peter Roscoe, Randy Hulkren, Rodney Davis in Central Illinois, Mike Boss in Southern Illinois. The Democrats' map for their 23 seats they need includes picking up three in Illinois. So I know people are basically centered in Will County in this larger area, but I know your circles of influence extend beyond where you live. So thinking about Roscombe's district and Hulkins district and Rodney Davis's district and Mike Boss district, 
These are all Second Amendment defenders. These are all conservative Republicans. These are all people that we need to see reelected to do our part in this state to make sure Republicans maintain their majorities in D.C. And on the state side, legislative side, you've got Mark Adnick right here in Plainfield. I mean, with due respect to Margo, she's, uh, you know, she's not going to like me saying this. She's going to be good. And I know Margo's going to you know, sprint through the finish line. So uh, we'll watch, but I'm not worried. But other races, you know, the suburbs have changed. And we have to motivate people. We have to get people to reimagine what's possible in Illinois. Because if we're not driving the conversation, then they are. And what's their conversation? Make a referendum on Trump. Make it a referendum on the NRA. We have a lot of good candidates in the suburbs. And we need to hold our incumbents. And we need to pick up seats. By the way, that's important too. Um, but I'm, I'm not like an optimist or a pessimist. I'm kind of the guy who says a half full glass is twice as big as it needs to be. I'm a realist. So I'm thinking about our opportunities here. We can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can defend incumbents and also be on offense for seats that we can win. And the way we do that is by offering a value proposition that neither party has offered for the better part of the last two decades. And I will tell you, again, I know the focus here that animates many of you is Second Amendment rights, and that's fair. But something else that unifies the state that should animate all of us your home, your home, the largest investment most people make in their life that's being liquidated by state and local government in Illinois. Liquidated. Uh, we've done, I mean, story after story after story. We set up a database where people can get a free property tax report on their home in the entire Chicago metropolitan region. We've spent a million and a half bucks on SaveYourHomeNow.org campaign telling people stories and encouraging people to tell their stories to radiate it out to change the conversation and make this the referendum issue. Because whether you are a middle income family with a $250,000 home or you're Scotty Pippen trying to sell your place in Highland Park, you can't get out from underneath it unless you're willing to take an absolute bath. Because you can't get a return on investment in a state that features the highest property taxes in the nation. And this is something that is postpartisan. We're seeing it with the stories that are told, with the people that we're talking to, with the polling, and it's moving numbers. So obviously, I encourage you to focus your conversation within your circles of influence on whatever issues you want. But I would encourage you to make property taxes central. It is the issue that animates families in this state across every demographic it is unified. Three, four, five percent of your home value property taxes every year and the negative multiplier effect, how that destroys home equity. You don't own your home in Illinois, you rent it from the government to pay for somebody else's guaranteed seven figure pension. That's what's happening. No question about it. It is not arguable. The facts are the facts are the facts. And most people you talk to are in this place right now, revolt or bolt. Either we revolt against the way things are and the people who've made them the way they are, or I begin to slowly or quickly execute my exit strategy. And obviously down here, being so close to Indiana, I'm sure you see that more pronounced than people in Chicago or places that are not adjacent to other states. Those uh, border counties to other states are where you're really seeing the atrophy, where you're really seeing the flight. Of course you are. I can lower my cost of living by 40% by moving 15 minutes away. Pretty compelling. And get a return on investment, get three times the house. We have to make this a conversation about something that is wheelhouse for us. Not always be in a defensive posture about issues they think they can motivate people emotionally on. And by the way, that's what I'm doing. So in Park Ridge, for example, 
where uh, Marco, to her credit, somebody that's trying to build the party, not just worried about her own seat, was up walking this past weekend. Marilyn Smolensky, domestic abuse survivor. She started a company that outfits women to conceal carry. And she also does women's safety advocacy courses and training courses. And, I, and she's running against a, a, literally a Madigan cheerleader, like the guy who leads cheers for Mike Madigan in Springfield. Literally, not figured. And she's getting hammered because, you know, she believes in that women should be able to protect themselves. So it would be nice to see people in a dead heat race you know, pick up opportunity in northwest suburban Cook County, think kind of regionally about November 6th when it comes to state legislative races. If you give Mike Madigan, or if we allow Mike Madigan to have a supermajority again, and the Senate will stay a supermajority, at least for the next two years, depending on what happens at the statewide level, maybe somewhat immaterial. We've got to get the House back. We've got to get the suburbs back. And we've got to be a party that has a definitive value proposition. We're going to be the party that gives people their homes back. You give us power back, we give you your home value back. That's a pretty good deal. That's what people want. That's what people crave for. You're weird. I mean, people are getting hurt in a way they haven't been hurt before, even in this robust 4% GDP growth economy, because you can't keep up with the property taxes. It's theft. It's theft. We should be emotional about this issue. The way they're emotional, demagoguing, gun rights, Trump, extremism, anti-woman, whatever. We should be emotional about people having their life's investments taken from them. This moves people. And this combined with the Kavanaugh bounce that we've gotten the last couple of weeks, which has redounded to state and local races, as I mentioned at the outset gives us a chance to surprise some people on November 6th. And maybe, maybe convince people to have high expectations for Illinois and for the Illinois Republican Party again. Because I'll tell you where I'm at. I'm either going to have no expectations or I'm going to have high expectations. But I'm not going to settle for muddling along to oblivion like we've been doing for the last 20 years. I'm not going to do it. So um, we do it one way or the other. And if we're going to do zero expectations and just take what we're given, uh, make the moral relativist choice, uh, concede power to people who have proven themselves enemies inside our perimeter, then, you know, I'll watch what happens in Illinois from Naples like everybody else. And honestly, let's start having adult conversations with adults in our social circles. And stop with this sort of fortune cookie bromide reading off people's mail pieces. Your home is at stake. Your life's work as is, is at stake. The respect that you're not being given for deciding to drop stakes in this state and make a home here, make a life here for your family, completely disrespected and dismissed. So we either start putting serious people in office at the head of our party where the serious people will continue to leave. And this will continue to be a failed state. This will continue to be a bad example. This will continue to be sort of a vacuum in the center of the Midwest. That's the choice on November 6th. And it starts at the state legislative level. And if we make these pickups, we can roll that into spring elections next year. I think, and I will hopefully, um, get involved in aldermanic races in the city of Chicago in the mayor's race. This idea that as a party, we just pretend that uh, this little three million person hamlet next to Lake doesn't exist, it's idiocy. And we've been doing it for 40 years. That's no way to change the composition of the party, the energy of the party, the potential for success for the party. November 6th, pick out races, local, local county board races, got it, legislative races. One, two, maybe. Can be close, like Batman. He's in a good position because he's done a good job of independently branding himself. 
but they're pounding away at him. You know, Madigan has spent north of 400 grand on for his opponent. So take nothing for granted. And let's get our good incumbents, our conservative reform leaders like Matt Hank and Margo, Alicia, pick up opportunity against Natalie Manley, for goodness sakes. Let's get them across the finish line. Let's narrow the deficit between Republicans and Democrats in the House so that regardless of what happens at the statewide level, we have an opportunity in 20 and 22 to flip this thing around more quickly than people think it can be done the way again, that Walker and Republicans did in 2010. And look at the change in Wisconsin under conservative reform leadership in the governor's mansion and in the Wisconsin state legislature in eight short years. It's going to happen here. It should happen here. It's up to us to make it happen here. Thank you. Ah. Uh -huh. 